Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome. It's Wednesday, November 7, 2018, to the Collaborative Gain webinar. My first year as CEO of a public company with Jason Randall, the CEO of Appfolio. I'm really excited to have Jason with us, and I will be introducing him in a moment. Before I do that, though, I just wanted to say a few things to everyone. First of all, we're doing a increasing number of webinars. We had one earlier this week, also a career journey webinar with uh, Stephen Roach, who is the president of Walton Enterprises, which is the Walton family office, the family behind Walmart. Um, and that was really uh, a terrific uh, call. And, and today I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation with Jason. Um, we have 21 peer coaching calls coming up in the next eight weeks. This is where when a member has a question, we'll go find four or five other members or alums, people in our network that we trust who have expertise on that question, and we'll convene everyone and moderate an hour long dialogue to give you help. We have all kinds of things coming up. Just this week, we have a peer coaching call on advice on security and compliance, uh, a CEO discussion on mindset, uh, mindset shift. Next week, a CEO discussion on uh, the turnaround experience, a marketing discussion. Now, these are not open to all the members. They're open to the member who's asked and the three or four people we've identified as experts. But we want everyone to participate in this program. And so if you have a question, get in touch with us. We're also doing a number of outbound calls. And I'm trying to interview every member of the councils over the next couple of months for my book, which is uh, in process and going well. We also have eight small dinners between now and February all over the country and we want to keep creating more of those so let us know if you'd like to have a small dinner uh, in your neighborhood or on a particular theme and we will make that happen all right now let me shift gears and introduce uh, the wonderful Jason Randall so Jason and I first met 10 years ago when he joined the associate councils a program we were then running for senior managers and directors and he was a, actually a senior director of product he joined uh, the councils, the associate councils. 10 years later, Jason's continued to be a member um, as his career has developed and has he's been promoted from director to senior director to vice president uh, to senior vice president GM. And then as of a year ago to president and CEO of Appfolio. The first time he was ever president and CEO of a company and the first time it was a, of a public company. And in fact, we put together a peer coaching call for Jason around this time a year ago uh, with other public company CEOs, giving him some advice on things to do and things what, and that he should not do. Um, in the years since he, he's become president and CEO, the company's been named one of the top 10 fastest growing SaaS companies, uh, publicly held SaaS companies, and Glassdoor named Jason Randall one of the top CEOs to work for, which is fantastic. How did he do it? How did he go from the director of product to the CEO in 10 years? In this call, Jason's going to talk about his career journey, about what he's learned, about the power of asking for help, his passion for customer experience and great work culture, and other things, other habits that have helped him develop. Of course, we want you to ask questions. And so use the question monitor on the go to webinar control panel. Um, I just realized, Jason, when we first met you, of course, you were working for GoToWebinar for, well, Citrix Online. Um, uh, so that's uh, uh, relevant that we're doing this. Um, and we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Okay. So, hey, Jason, thank you so much uh, for coming here today, but also thank you for being a, a, a leader that can inspire and teach us so much by how you are. Um, so with further ado, let me pass it to you. Thank you, Phil. and. I appreciate that awesome introduction. I, I realize now as a longtime council member, it's kind of a bucket uh, list item to get introduced by Phil Terry. So now I, I get to check that one off and it feels great. <laughs> I love introducing people. As you know, I'm passionate about people uh, who and passionate about the good, good things they do. So very cool. Yeah. And uh, for go to webinar, I, I did work at Citrix Online. And it was um, under, I was the one who led the market validation for the GoToWebinar product. So it's still, <laughs> it's, it's still awesome to see it still, still in, in use today. Here we are. 
Okay, good. So a quick introduction to myself. Um, I, uh, this is me, one of the first days working at Appfolio 10 years ago when I joined, putting together my own desk. We were truly in startup mode, no customers, no revenue, um, just getting off the ground. And I remember, I remember having a conversation with my wife. My, my third daughter was just born six months before I joined. And this was a big risk. I was coming from a, a great career arc, a great job. And she's like, are you sure you know what you're doing here? You know, less money, more risk. Um, <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. I, I feel really good about this opportunity. She supported me. So it's, it's worked out well. But, um, you know, you'll see from my talk today, there are times where you have to jump outside of your, your, your zone of comfort or your comfort zone or the path that you're on. So I, I am a, a fanatically customer focused. The, the councils has really helped drill this into me and give me good practices. You'll see that today. Um, I believe strongly in culture. We have a board member who is constantly telling me culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I know he got that from somewhere because I hear it all over the place, but I, I'm much more comfortable in the strategy side, but um, I'm a huge believer in the culture side. I graduated UCSB, which is here in Santa Barbara, where our headquarters are at. I love product development, love product management. Um, dad of three, born and raised in Southern California. And actually, I'm a home brewer. I, I brew my own beer. It was the last hobby I kept once my kids came. It was too cool to give up. So I've been doing that for a long time. Jason, can you bring some some of that beer up to San Francisco? For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been at that a few times. And a few of my friends, uh, Bruce and Mark, on the Councils are always asking me the same thing, so I, I need to figure that out. <laughs> cool. Okay, so quick uh, Appfolio. Again, I've been here 10 years. We're now a publicly traded company. Went public about three years ago, uh, serving over 22,000 customers. And what I'm really uh, proud of is our customers are fans of ours. We're fans of our customers, but our customers are fans of ours. And I get a lot of questions from our customers um, asking how we do our culture and how they can emulate our culture and bring that back to their own offices. So I love inspiring, not just helping our customers, but inspiring them to, to uh, drive better businesses as well. Um, we have, like when I joined, we were a couple dozen people. We're now up over 850 and growing pretty rapidly. Wow. Okay, so... Phil mentioned this, my career growth, and this goes back to my uh, product management days at Citrix. I actually joined Citrix in 2003 as the go to my PC product manager, and then kind of grew my career there and jumped over to Appfolio in 2008. And uh, one of the things that Phil asked me was kind of, you know, where would you plot on this line that you knew you wanted to be CEO? Where did that come from? And it, it I have to take one step back to kind of talk about that. And I think this relates to a lot of people. For me, as I pushed through uh, my career and kind of grew, I would get to a, a level and I would kind of take an assessment. You know, it, do I feel overextended and not overextended physically or, you know, calendar, uh, but do I feel like I have the capability to, to do this role well? And each step of the way, um, I would push myself to, to grow, get to that position, and then do, do that assessment and decide, okay, yeah, I, I think I do, and I think I can move to that next level. And I never felt, I never ran into a ceiling, a moment when I'm like, oh my gosh, there's no way I can do the next level. I can barely do what I'm doing now. Um, so I, I always knew I wanted to keep kind of growing my career, um, but then I always knew, uh, knew to be honest with myself of when you know, kind of the right level was attained and uh, what was going to be right for me. And luckily, I never hit that, never hit that moment and still feel, feel good about where I'm at. Jason, I, yeah. do you ever ask other people, trusted people from your wife to, I don't know, mentors or whatever, uh, what they thought about that question? Like, did they think, you, you know, or was that something you did, uh, you know, sort of internally on your own? Yeah, that was internally okay and that was something where i just really never wanted to be i wanted to be honest with myself about that and yeah having that foundation then helped me push into those next growth areas right right cool now one of the things i did do though is i did want to plant the seed early about the ceo role and so when i came over 
back in 2008, I talked to the founders, I talked to the CEO, and I just told them, hey, look, if, if the uh, current CEO, Brian, ever steps aside, I would just love to be part of that consideration for his successor. And you said did, that all the way back in 2008? I did. I said it back in 2008. And I, wow. And I didn't say well, that. It was a small company at the time. 12. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, right, right. It's not like you came in VP of a thousand person company and said, yeah, I'd like to be the CEO if the guy steps down. All right. I get that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I did, I did reiterate it and, but, but I, I didn't do it in a way where it was like, Hey, I have to reach this level or else I'm, you know, out of here or, um, yeah. this is, something that's, you know, so important to me. It's, it's more important than everything else. I just was really, Hey, I just want to be part of that conversation. And, and that was really important actually that I did that. And now looking back on it, it was yeah. important for me to do it from the perspective of, again, uh, putting that ceiling for myself really high and knowing that this was a possibility for myself. Yeah. Um, but then it also let the others help me, right? So they, they were now looking out for opportunities for me to grow my skill set or thinking about me in certain ways. And so that's one piece of advice that I would give is if you feel like you, you know, have something you want to attain, even if it's going to be 10 years out, you know, get the people around you to help. It's not, um, and, and people love to help. And I got a ton of help along the way to get to where I'm at now. That's good. So, um, you all, yeah, go ahead. Some people feel like, oh, I shouldn't say anything. I should kind of hide that, my ambition, right? And you're saying quite the opposite. Be open about it. But don't be, don't be like demanding about it, but, but be open about it and, and ask for help. I love that. Yes. Yes. I think ambition is, is natural. And I, I love to see the ambition in people. I mean, this is, yeah. this is, shows me that they're really thinking yeah. about themselves and the company. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, when I joined the councils way back at, at, in, in 2008, you know, the number one reason I joined the councils was really just to push myself outside of my comfort zone. You know, uh -huh. I had, a, I had this, the bubble of like, uh, you know, where, where I thought I was comfortable and it was like, you know, I have the same fears and insecurities as everyone else. Everyone else is, you know, so much kind of fill in the blank, smarter, more experienced, more likable, whatever the insecurities are. And I joined the councils just to kind of push that bubble out further and say, I got to try something new. I got to uh, experience different things, learn from, from new people. So I really appreciated that opportunity and, uh, and just kept myself going, even though sometimes it wasn't always comfortable, just kept pushing that out there. Cool. So one of the things that really helped me when I um, came became CEO was uh, uh, leaning on our traditions as a company. So the, the two guys on the left, or my, my left as I'm looking at the screen, are the founders. Then next to me is our CEO, uh, former CEO, Brian, and I'm sitting down. And they're kind of, <laughs> we, we framed it like this because the responsibility is kind of flowing from each person. They're like, nope, not it, not it, not it, nope, now you're it. <laughs> we have this tradition around these oars. When the company was first started and Brian joined as CEO a year before I joined the company, uh, Klaus and John, the founders, and about a dozen of the current employees went river rafting. And then Klaus symbolically handed the oar over to Brian and said, Brian, you're now steering the ship. And this was um, them handing the oar to me. And we did this at a company meeting as well. And, and oars are a big tradition here. We've got them hung on our walls for every milestone we go through as a company. Uh, we, we put an oar up and everyone gets to sign it to be part of that big milestone. And so I've got an oar in my office from the, the, the founders and CEO and my team. And we did this as a company. So this really helped us. It helped like uh, legitimize it for everybody in the company and really minimize disruption and just help everyone feel like, okay, this is, this is a big deal, but it's actually natural and normal and something we, we all support. Cool. Another thing that happened for me was uh, during the selection process of becoming a CEO uh, was the, the benefit of growing with the company. So having been there from the beginning, you know, I was labeled as the insider, right? The insider candidate and the board, of course, 
uh, goes through a pretty thorough process uh, looking comparing against external candidates and uh, the advice typically is if the company's doing well go with an internal candidate if things really need to be shaken up and you need to get on a different direction go externally um, but i have to say just being that insider um, has helped me so much in the tra transition because there's so many parts that of the company that i know where it came from and where it could be going uh, i had a, a firsthand uh, seat helping shape the culture and so there was so much I could build with, um, but it also has its its uh, risks as well, um, because you you do need to plot your own course, and so you have to be able to kind of step out and see where your blind spots are. So I'm hugely excited about our opportunities, and one of the first things I did was really talk to the message of of uh, we're just starting that. We would paint the picture of the last 10 years and all that we had accomplished. Um, but I would tell people, and it was absolutely 100% true, that when I come to work every day, I am so excited because I feel like we just started. We just um, got to uh, the, the product as a ton of momentum. Um, we have great customers. We have great profits we can invest back into the business. And now we can really go after the mission of the company and redefine that and so just really painting that kind of bright star that we're heading towards and and talk about that really help people um, uh, get through the transition and help me get through the transition as well that's your kind of equivalent of bezos is day one yes exactly and i this, this isn't this isn't something i had to go create i this is absolutely true for us and i i believe it and i'm you know more excited than i was even you know in those startup days for the future of the company yeah yeah cool so that gets me to my first 90 days and i picked uh, this picture i love this picture this is one month after the transition um, i'm standing in front of our customer conference there's about 800 customers and probably 300 employees sitting out in the audience there um, and i am now the face of the company giving the keynote addressed and boy talk about outside my comfort zone you know i'm naturally introverted i would uh, don't love the spotlight but here it is the spotlight's on me and so um, i did a lot of things to kind of prepare myself for this this pushed me outside my comfort zone um, but i certainly feel you know even looking at this feel like wow is that really me can i really do this you know that kind of imposter syndrome and i i i felt that for sure um, taking over the role, you know, I tried to do what I could to prepare for the role. And in fact, I've been working with a coach now for a couple of years. And uh, I think, uh, Phil, you actually helped me connect with the coach that I work with. Oh, and cool. yeah, and we we started from the the mission of like preparing me for the CEO role. And this was huh? this is well before and what I loved about that was it gave us something to work towards on. And kind of throw stuff hey this is going well this isn't going well um and it was again preparing me um, but you can you can only be still prepared and you learn a lot in those first 90 days of what the role is really like and what you thought and what the the big differences are so i had to really be visible and accessible in ways that i hadn't before and build that credibility um, um, but then also determine what really mattered to me and I got the, the question posed to me by someone who was helping inside uh, the company with the transition. And I was like, okay, what, you know, what's your message? What do you want to tell people? And I thought, oh, that will be easy. I can just write that down. When I went to write that down, I was like, wow, you know, I kind of just live by instinct a lot here. I don't really know what that is. And I had to go back to the roots of our values and what we, who we are as a company and list those out. And I, wrote them down um, in a way that the company could digest, but I kind of wanted to talk about them in terms of the transition and in, in becoming that CEO. So the first one that I really emphasized was this connecting with customers and just went back to it and being able to go back to the roots of the company. And this has always been important to us. Um, but again, something that I was able to help uh, uh, shape. Now, I love this picture 
because this is a, a long-term customer. I think they've just celebrated their nine-year anniversary on our platform. And I had done a customer visit with them early when I first joined. And I went up there again uh, recently, did another customer visit with them. And um, the, the uh, gentleman standing second to left is the owner of the business. And next to him is his daughter. And when we first visited them, his daughter was still in high school uh, playing <laughs> soccer. I remember this. And now he's passing the baton of the business over to her and her husband, who's in the picture as well. And this is just, I, I love this. And the feeling that I get from really being part of these customers' lives and helping them grow their business and successfully pass their business on to the next generation. And I uh, emphasize this every, t every chance I get uh, talking to customers, but really try to lead by example. And so this is something we, I think, as an organization pride ourselves on is at every level connecting with the customers. And I know, Phil, it's near and dear to your heart. Yes, great. I love that. I love the photo. The yeah, that, that dog was still, that was, that was the same dog. We have a picture and the, the dog is the same dog and we couldn't believe it. It was nine years later, but it's still the same <laughs> in office. Great. Um, the next one is this culture and caring for your people. And again, the spotlight's not natural for me, um, but I, I, uh, I, you have to lead by example and uh, emphasizing the culture, building a great culture, uh, and being that culture carrier. And I, I noticed this, just this was a big change. Again, I'd worked at the company for a long time, um, but people definitely listened to me in different ways than they did before I assumed the CEO role. And things I say or do are picked up on in ways that I don't even realize at this point. So, um, you know, kind of putting that on every day when I come into the office that, yeah, this is, this culture is a reflection of me. Um, I need to shape that, but you need to do that by uh, example and uh, kind of living it the way you want, you want to model it for everybody else. What are we looking at here, by the way? Uh, this is our um, R&D team at okay. a, a hack day. So every twice a year we do a hack day, 24 hours. They get to work on whatever they want and present it and it's always got a theme this one was called game on i think and they take a picture um so we do these just to inspire innovation and let the right cool um so change is hard you know we all say that but change is hard for for everyone and it was hard for me as part of the transition uh, in the first year um and hard for th those in the company as well and um, the CEO that I replaced, Brian, we all loved him. Very well liked. He had grown the company to where it was, very successful. Uh, it was not easy to see him go. And uh, for, for me, I remember, I remember one instance in particular, um, talking to a senior leader that, that again, the, C, the CEO had hired and we you know, built this whole team. And I was kind of charting my own course on something and saying, no, I think we want to do it this way. And you could just see the, that the realization of, okay, things are really going to change here. It's not going to be the same, you know, even though it's, it's still going to be great. And we all realized that because everyone had known me just change is actually just tough from change perspective. And I think my big learning was not to, not to, to worry about that too much, that it is a natural process. It's going to be a natural process for me to assume the new role, but it's going to be a natural process for everyone around me. Um, to get through it as well, and they're going to go through it at their their own pace, and and not pers you know take that personally or try to feel like I had to somehow control that. Um, so there are some things I can control in the message or the culture, but there are some things I can't control, and, th and that's okay. Cool. And then of course asking for help. <laughs> talked about that again. I love this picture. It's, uh, we asked for a picture of our council. And of course, Jonathan is front and center in the picture. I think in every picture of our council, he's the charismatic CEO that gets highlighted. So I'm going to have to make fun of him for, for that next time I see him. <laughs> um, so asking for oh, backcountry.com, the guy second from the left, just so people know. Yeah. So this has been a huge, huge help for me um, along the way. And I, I uh, continue to 
work hard to practice this. And again, sometimes it's like, well, you're the CEO, you should know the answers to everything. And absolutely, I don't know the answers to everything. Um, and I try to practice it. And the people, I get a lot of questions about the board. You know, what's it like working for a company that's public? What is the board like? What do you have to do? Um, and I think there's a lot of kind of uncertainty and stories about that. Um, but one of my, you know, grounding principles here is I will uh, ask the board for help when I need it and, uh, you know, have that vulnerability and, and work on that to build the trust there. Um, and, you know, I, I need help from, from every level, uh, sideways, up and down. Um, so I think this has been just a, a really good uh, grounding point for me that, hey, you don't have to know everything. You can't ask for help. Um, and, and even at the council's this last meeting or the meeting before, I had an issue that I brought to the council's that was starting to worry me. I didn't have any experience with and, you know, heard from a few other people who had dealt with something similar and I was like, okay, yeah, I can handle this. This is not something that's going to um, make or break me. And there are ways to get through this. So I, I can't emphasize this enough. And I know, I know Phil that you you talk about this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Customers and asking for help. And they're, yep. they're very connected to being open to input from others, right? Um, so. Yep. And it's helped me a ton. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The next one I wanted to talk about was this owning the vision. And yeah. this one was really important to demonstrate that confidence in our success. You know, even if I don't necessarily feel it all the time, um, the Again, the, the company really picks up on, on uh, my I'm approaching things from a confident, hey, yeah, we do have challenges in our business. It's okay to acknowledge them, but we're, I feel very confident we're going to overcome them. Um, and practicing this, this clarity over certainty, something that was uh, drilled into me early in my career that you know, you can't ever be 100% certain on anything, but what you can do is provide clarity on the what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so just practicing that and owning that vision and, and knowing that vision might change, things might change, that's okay. Um, but again, just emphasizing the clarity over, over certainty. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that was really surprising to me is just, again, how much people pick up on stuff. So one of the I do these copies with the CEO where I'll go and talk to groups and teams. And I, I early, I was getting the question you know, to ask me, but then it was <laughs> happening every single time. And I, I'd throw out a few books I was reading and then I'd walk through the office and I'd see those books on people's desks. And then we'd be reading them and coming and talking to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to be really careful here. Because if I just throw out some offhanded comment, I mean, people really pick up and run on this stuff. So, um, you know, own that vision. Games. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, owning the vision, but, but doing it in a thoughtful, a thoughtful way that helps people yeah. really build excitement and alignment and security for the company. Cool. Um, and I think this is one where, you know, it, it might sound a little bit trite, but I had to, I had to ground myself in this uh, being you, you know, I'm not the same as our previous CEO. He had things that he uh, did that will be better than I can ever do them. Um, but of course I have strengths that uh, you know, are my own strengths that I can bring to the table. Um, and so over time, you know, the, uh, the, one of the board members pulled me aside right after the transition and said, look, it's, you know, you, you're going to be the face of the organization. It's okay to make your mark. You don't have to just fill someone else's shoes or what kind of came before you. In fact, as a board member, we want you to plot your own course. Um, and that was really freeing for me. You know, you have these little moments where you're just like, oh yes, I was worried about something I don't need to worry about. Um, and I think I really draw on my career in product to a lot. I mean, I loved product management for anyone out there who's in product as a kind of path to this kind of leadership. Um, product gives you the ability to interact with just about anyone in the company because you really are a central 
point for the business, which I which really helped me a lot, especially in the early days, getting to learn all the different functions of a business. Um, but what I also took away from being in product was the fact that product tends to have a lot of responsibility without a lot of authority, meaning you might be responsible for a product line, but not everyone's reporting to you. You know, you've got to you've got to figure out how to influence people and, and lead uh, and provide vision and alignment. And those are the things that still help me to this day, um, those skills, even though now I do have the authority, uh, you know, influencing and leading uh, not with authority, but uh, through um, uh, understanding and again, alignment is so much more powerful. And so that's really helped me. Soft power versus hard power. Yeah, and I think that my my um, journey through product management really helped tr train train that into me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so looking forward, um, I I I do have a ton of mentors. Now, this is a our customer conference with Mel Robbins. She's got this five second rule. We had her talk, and just seeing everyone light up with this idea of how to improve and how to get better um, really inspired me too uh, but you know i'm always trying to improve again asking for help um, but one of the pieces of advice i got early on in my career too was uh, learn and just practice being a good listener and this is a skill too that i i work on every day uh, so still um, and it's it's really hard to do to be that good listener when people feel like they've been heard um, and then to also then take that input that you got, there's always something, you know, when people are talking to you, there's, even if you don't agree, there's always some nugget in there um, that you can take away from. And so reflecting on that. So I work on that uh, uh, pretty constantly. And, and I have, you know, my, my whole career is chock full of these people who are what I would call mentors, but probably don't know they've been mentors, um, you know, uh, up and down and, and it doesn't matter kind of where they were, but they, by being a good listener and, and doing what I, what, what what good advice I got, I'm always trying to take away learnings from my interactions with people. So it's been a huge, huge help for me. Okay, good. I think we're right at the Great. 12 30 well, time. I'm gonna I'm gonna call on some people, Jason. Uh, but before I do that, could could you share um any mistakes that you made along the way that like oh boy don't if you don't do that um kind of things yeah i mean my mistakes um my mistakes again kind of relate back to a lot of what i was talking about and i'm sure i could come up with a million you know little examples of, of mistakes i made yeah um, they are kind of just being secure, not not listening, not um, yeah. uh, not taking in the feedback. Um, but then I've also made mistakes where I've let that kind of uh, uncertainty cloud me or prevent me from making a decision that needs to be made. Yeah. And so uh, I, you know, sometimes your gut tells you, yep, this is the, you need to get here. This is what you need to do. And everyone around you might be telling you, no, 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 that's going to be a mistake. Um, and you gotta, you gotta sort that out. And I think my, my biggest mistakes were sometimes when even after the, the listening, I still felt a certain way and felt like, no, I'm, I'm right on this one. Uh, I'm not going uh, there. And I, and it, and the big learning there is for me is it's okay to make mistakes. You know, that's like, yeah. we're not, it is okay. Even at my level, a public company, if I say the wrong thing, you know, things can go pretty bad for us. Um, but I still have to be open to making mistakes. Um, otherwise, I, I will stop growing. Yeah. And it sounds like you're compassionate towards your own mistakes. Is that fair? Yes, I would say so. Um, and, you know, I'm definitely compassionate towards others' mistakes. Um, yeah, those, those two things are linked. In other words, if you're not compassionate of your own mistakes, you will not be of others. Uh, that's something that I try to help people see. Um, that it really, you got to really forgive yourself before you can, you know, forgive or be compassionate towards others. Yeah, and I, I think that that's, you still have to hold yourself accountable and hold other people accountable. Yes, of course. And you yeah. can do those two things together. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. Let me. Um, so I'm going to call on some people. Sean, I see that you're with us. So Sean Sweeney, um, uh, is it Starbucks? Um, Sean, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, Great. Um, did you have any thoughts or comments for Jason? Well, I have, a, I have a question, Jason. Um, first off, thanks so much for sharing. Um, incredibly insightful. Um, did you did you purposefully build yourself a kind of network or board of advisors the informally um, through your process it kind of supported you through making some of the tough choices you did i guess i did and again sometimes the the people knew they were on my board of advisors so sometimes they didn't you know, <laughs> wasn't official, but i would go to them and ask them questions um so yes i was purposeful um, and that, that was, again, one area I had to push myself outside of my comfort zone, you know, especially early in my career thinking, oh, wow, it's kind of a sign of weakness if you have to ask for help or, or yeah. you know, you don't know what you're doing. That's bad. Well, no, that's not. That's actually normal. Um, so, yes, I did. And I, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be 100 people. It could be at that moment one person who's really helping you or two. Um, uh, you know, the right people for the right time in your, your life. And so that, that's that been extremely helpful for me. That's yeah. good. I, I'm trying to do the, the same thing. I, and probably similarly to you, it's, you only have so much time. I got three kids just the same way that you do. <laughs> how do you make the, how do you make the time to, um, it, and it's really an investment in you. And I, I totally get that, but the logic sometimes doesn't uh, triumph over you know when you're pressed or spread thin yeah uh, so many priorities yeah. yeah it's it's a constant balancing act um, but i think you know you you prioritize what's really important to you and so if it is important um, you'll do it but also don't force it either i guess is the other thing i would say is yeah. you know sometimes you can get in these modes you read a book or something it's like oh you need to do these five steps and you'll be successful you got to be you you know do what's natural for, for you, um, what feels good for you. One one recipe doesn't fit everybody. All right. Good counsel. Uh, so appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, all right, Laurel Stanley, I think you're with us. Uh, so Laurel works for Steelcase, uh, where she runs with her experience. Laurel, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So what? <laughs> What did you think about what Jason said today and what questions, comments, thoughts do you have? Yeah, so Jason, thank you so much. It's it's really interesting to think about your role and then also to think about, and my question is, and I'm just curious if you have thoughts on, um, you know, our, I, I guess, and I was really interested that you said something about that you have coffees with the CEO and you um, have, it sounds like a really open culture and I'm, you know, I have a perspective about where I sit in um, access and availability to my CEO and wanting to make sure that, you know, if I engage him, um, that it's it's also purposeful. But um, how do you maintain the relationships that you have with the folks that you, you know, have in your organization? Um, and is there, does it, um, does it seem more difficult in your role to have um, a kind of a, you know, how do you engage like new employees or how, how do you sort of make sure that you're accessible, but also um, maintain your position? I don't know if I'm asking that correctly. No, I, I totally get it. And it's, it's, um, it's something I have to purposely work on. And so not only do the, I do the coffees with the CEO, I do, um, try to do them weekly, skip level lunches with employees throughout the company. But we're, you know, over 800 employees now. So it's getting very, very difficult for me to even hit a, you know, talk to a fraction of them. So, um, you know, what I try to do in those discussions with employees is, like I said, be a good listener. Um, those aren't necessarily the time for me to be, you know, kind of talking the most. Um, and what I'm trying to do is just, let people know that it's okay again to be you and have a take and you can be wrong. Um, and I don't want people to feel like they just 
every time they're with me, they have to have the perfect answer or be positioning or, you know, trying to get something out of me. Um, so I think it, it goes both ways, but you, you just have to, when you do have those opportunities with your CEO, just like, you know, be, be yourself and, and uh, uh, talk about work stuff or personal stuff, but just start to slowly build that relationship and it will, it will grow. Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh, so great. What is ask them what book they read and then read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on your desk. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's great. Great, Laurel. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paige, you have a question, so I'm going to call on you. Um, are you there, Paige? I don't know if she realizes I just did that. Paige? Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. Well, I will share her question, um, and then you can speak to it because she typed it up. She um, she was wondering the challenges you found from a communications perspective, Jason, specifically changes in information you could share internally, uh, you know, versus externally, and also timing of what you can share. Uh, she's uh, she's chief of staff at LiquidNet, which is a, a trading platform. Yeah. Um, this was one we had a lot of conversations on. So we, we, I love to be as transparent as possible, you know, to arm the people who are actually doing the work with as much information as we can so they can make the best decisions. Yeah. But we have constraints and the constraints are there to protect people from information that, you know, is, is, is protects them and protects the company. And so we've had to, we've had to readjust and strike a balance. Um, and I think what you want to do is you want to, you know, whatever the, the right culture is for the company, start by that and then look at the, the new um, way you have to approach information through that lens. And so we were able to still convey a lot of the same information, um, but we just had to bundle it up and time it a little bit differently. You know, so when you, we, we do a company meeting every quarter and before we would talk about results, um, right away, but now we wait for the queue to file, and then we talk about results because that's public information. Um, there are certain parts, certain information like sales numbers that are a lot more sensitive than other parts of information, just knowing which ones those are. And so I would just say, yes, it is real. You, you do have to address it. Uh, don't change the culture dramatically and just be thoughtful about the, the piece of information uh, that you do want to convey. Um, and uh, uh, then go with that and just, you know, every, everything's a risk. It's all this, you know, everything's a risk orientation, but uh, go with that. And I think our, our pivot too, especially as you grow in employees, the messaging, you know, and the, the messaging that I uh, talk about um, is less specific. We can drive specific details about the business down to the groups, um, but the messaging overall stays the same. So maybe we're not talking about specific sales numbers, but we are talking about how important it is that, you know, our new customers are happy once they're on the platform. And so you can still talk about some of the similar things without necessarily sharing all the exact data, but it is something real. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I'm going to try unmuting Paige one more time. Paige, are you there? I know she said she's there. I, there I, she might be muted on her side. So um, hopefully that answered your question, Paige, and I'll uh, appreciate uh, your question. David Lowe, I'm going to unmute you. David, you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, uh, Jason, do you know? You might know Dave. You, <laughs> I think you guys were on the same council for a while. Yep, I know Dave. OK. Yeah. So, so Dave, what do you what do you think uh, what are you thinking about here with Jason? I was just typing here. Well, you know, actually, one of the things, Jason, I was curious. You know, one of your I'm not sure if you call them principles or the, that you shared was owning the long term vision. And the the question I have is, in your in the organization, how do you go about communicating, and uh, and inculcating across all even down to the front line teams what that vision and strategy is. And, and tying the work that they do to the strategy and the vision of the company. Like what are the, how do you make that happen on an ongoing basis? Yes, so 
one of the, the things that I talk about with people is I, I pretty much say the same things over and over and over. It's not, you know, there's not a lot new under the sun. Um, <laughs> and uh, the first thing is keep that vision simple, right? The more you have to have charts and graphs to back up the vision, the faster you're going to lose people. Um, but what the key, the key is what you just said is relating it to what the people are doing every day. And so that's why bringing it back to the customers is really uh, important and kind of brilliant linkage. Um, because if you, if you have a business and we've worked really hard to make sure that, you know, our business, our customer success is our success. You know, we're kind of linked. Uh, we, we have the same incentives. We, the more our customers are successful, the more we're successful. Then all of a sudden now everything you're doing to, help the customer be successful um, in all the different areas of the organization relate back over to that, to that vision. And strategy changes and execution changes, um, but if you paint the vision of, of being a growing, vibrant, healthy, long-term successful company, um, and then root that in the customers and a couple other key values that we kind of talk about, um, then again, the kind of the what of the day that you're doing doesn't matter as much. Hopefully that makes sense. Dave, you still there? I am. No, that's great. Thank you. I like okay. the connection to customer. Yeah. As a as a touchstone. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. Christoph, um, I'm gonna unmute you here. So Christoph um, is a VP of product at Perch. I don't think you guys have met, actually. I don't uh, think so. No, uh, yes, I am. OK, cool. So what did you think? Do you have any questions, comments, or thoughts for Jason? Um, I don't think I have any questions. I think this is uh, pretty amazing. I was especially uh, intrigued by the fact that you knew pretty much 10 years in advance uh, where you wanted to go. Uh, and you were confident enough to, to share it with the company. So I thought this was very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I don't think a lot of people do that, Jason. Do you have a sense of where did you learn that? Did where that where did that come from? I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, I I just had a feeling my whole career that I was working towards something. I guess, yeah. um, and it it was. I think I got lucky. I guess early enough, kind of knowing where that something was and matching it up against again, what I felt I was capable of, of doing. Um, so. And, and why were you interested 10 years ago in becoming CEO? Did you have a sense of that? Like what was there, you're introverted, so, and you don't like the spotlight. That's one of the reasons people sometimes like to become the CEO, but that certainly wasn't your reason. What, was there something else that was guiding that? I. Uh, I always felt, and I hope I can prove this true, that I could do a good job with it. That yeah. I could do with it. Uh, I can. This would be a good role for me. Match up my skills and what I love to do in yeah. building companies. And um, yeah, so I, I always felt like, yeah, that is something I think I could be good at. Yeah, that's great. Um, and what about what about habits that you've cultivated along the way that you think have been helpful to you? whether it's reading, whether it's, uh, as Sean asked you earlier about cultivating relationships, are there, are there sort of habits that you think uh, stood you well here? Um, and yeah. Helpful? Yeah. The reading one is interesting. You know, reading business books on your own is one thing. What we do is we'll pick a, a book and read it as a leadership team, yeah. you know, as an executive team, and I love that. Um, and we've done this many times while I've been here. I love it because it it uh, breaks down some barriers because you get a chance to talk about some concept that's not necessarily like, you know, make or break for the business of the day or some major issue. It's just some concept in some, you know, kind of hypothetical context. Right. Uh, but then it also, you know, and we'll reserve, we'll just do like 30 minutes out of each of our leadership meetings or executive meetings to have read a couple chapters and then talk about it. And what I also does, it, it, it actually builds connections, you know, without it being kind of forced. It's like, you know, the forced team building stuff I never really love. 
Um, but this actually does build kind of empathy and connections with people because you're talking about something again that's not uh, critical to someone's function or, or something. So that's right. one that I, I think has worked so well for us over the years and we continue to do. Plus it also, you know, and this is related to this last point you made about building connections. And by the way, I, I make this point in the in the new book I'm working on, which is to read, but to read with others. Um, and and you know, and have discussions with others about about the same book that it it also gives you, you you get to see you learn about different people's perspectives and you learn about them. Um, and, you know, like you said, it builds those connections, but it also teaches you something about how they see the world, um, which enriches your relationship, I believe. Is that That's is that right. your experience? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I think that's a really great uh, and easy to implement suggestion. Uh, like Pro Christoph, you could do that with your product team. Maybe you do do that with your product team. Um, uh, and and so could everyone on this call, Laurel, you could do it with your UX team. Um, it doesn't have to be just the leadership team of the company. All right, cool. Well, let me see. Um, let me call on uh, Michelle. Oh, let's see. Let me, does someone else have their hand up? No, okay. Michelle, I'm going to unmute you, Michelle Dupree. Michelle, are you there? Yes. <laughs> OK, you're next on the cold call list. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any thoughts or comments here for Jason? What do you think? Yeah, I, um, I've been hearing a recurring theme in my networking recently about the sort of doubt and imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, and and that's been really interesting to me you know i'm currently in a job search as you know um and it's something that's come up in our council and it's just interesting to hear people no matter how successful they are no matter where they at that they've all um encountered this like can i do it i'm not sure i can do it um it, it's just it's comforting in a way yes it should be jason would yeah. you agree yeah yeah and i, I mean uh, Phil, you know, I was, you were able to help organize the CEO council and, you know, uh, just to echo that comment, I hear it on that council too. You know, I'm, I'm not alone here. There's other CEOs, very successful, same thing. It's like, wow, this is, am I really the one supposed to know all the answers here? <laughs> you know, Howard Schultz, uh, the former CEO of Starbucks says that, you know, there's not a CEO he's ever met who, when they got into the role, thought they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, quite the opposite. They were sure they were going to be discovered as a fraud. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, every uh, Maya Angelou, the great poet, said this, you know, like famous actors, actresses, business leaders, you know, it doesn't matter. Presidents, you know, of the country. Um, uh, of course, there may be some presidents who don't know what they're doing, but I will, I will leave that aside. Uh, it's, uh, but in all seriousness, there's no single president that could actually feel like they know that job. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's like the job of everything. That's impossible. Um, but thank you. Yeah, Michelle. Okay, cool. Um, let me see. Who else can we, uh, anyone else want to raise their hand? Um, and I'm happy to, to bring in others. Um, Let's see, Eric Schultz. Um, Eric, you're you're at John Deere, right? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so, what, yeah, what do you think? Uh, any thoughts, comments, or questions? So I wish I had a really well thought out question ready for this, but I guess the, the main thing I would reflect on is I really appreciate the advice about uh, making your ambitions known. I think that's something that it, it uh, and it really ties right into the imposter syndrome thing that you talked about is those yeah. are all woven together, keeping your ambitions you know secret lest they be revealed to be too large or something. And so I think finding a way to make those ambitions known in a way that's constructive and will help you build your network towards um, being able to achieve those uh, those, uh, those ambitions that really resonated with me and that's something that I'm going to incorporate into my career planning and discussions with my managers going forward. That's great. That's fantastic. Look at that. You touched someone. All right, cool. And then uh, the last thing I'm going to do and hopefully you're uh, JJ, you're okay with this. Uh, JJ, can I have you join us? I was afraid you were going to do that, Phil. <laughs> so, <laughs> so JJ works at Apple. <laughs> 
So JJ, is Jason really a good CEO or is that? Is that <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I actually thought about raising my hand because so I've had the privilege of working with Jason. I've been at Appfolio for eight years and I have him to thank for actually hiring me um, back when he uh, was the VP of product. I'm now head of customer experience and grew my career here from leading the UX team. And something that he said, someone asked about transparency. And when I'm interviewing new people and they say, what do you really love about Appfolio? And there's so much, but one of the things I wanna just sort of also speak to and is this idea of like, how great um, Jason and the leadership team has been about being transparent about the things that can't be transparent about given the change of our company going public and all of these things. And I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's just like a really great finesse that really makes you feel like I'm in the know and I trust the things that I'm not in the know about um, because I really trust my leadership team. And I think that has to do a lot with you know Jason's track record of success here, but also to his point, staying connected, connected to people, um, and really kind of foundationally building that trust. So that's that's what I would add to the conversation. That's a great. That's a really great point, Jason. What what, what do you think about that? <laughs> yes, um, I, I I I appreciate the comments there, and just uh, what we talk about internally is just being purposeful. You know, sometimes you do have stuff you can't talk about, um, you know, be okay with that. Tell everyone this is what we can't talk about, um, but just be purposeful in your communication and just yeah. don't leave it to chance. And yeah. You from JJ. That's great. Well, we are, we are at the, the witching hour at the end of this conversation. Uh, Jason, I, I have to just say, uh, and let's see, I'm going to, can I, let's see. Can I unmute everybody? Um, is there a way to do that in this interface? Not sure there is, because I wanted to just have everyone clap. But I guess, you know, I'll, I'll clap. <laughs> just imagine everybody else is clapping. Um, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you spending the time. I want to thank everyone who, who came in with us live. Uh, you really helped enrich the conversation. And certainly will be this will be available uh, privately on the council site for members who missed it. So I hope uh, those who are listening later find this helpful. And um, and Jason, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see what day one looks like a year from now at Appfolio and what you guys create over the next 12 months um, as you continue to grow and and really lead in creating great cultures and uh, and and happy customers. So thank you, thank you, everybody. Oh, did I mute Jason? Maybe I muted Jason. Oh, well. Looks like I did. I'll unmute you, Jason. <laughs> Jason, you're unmuted. Yeah. OK, <laughs> thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, so much fun. OK, thank you. All Bye. right. Bye-bye. Was I, was I muted? Oh, well.